farmland now. Your facilitators are Ned Creeden, the Director of Public Markets, University of Illinois Foundation, and Martin Davies, President and CEO of the Westchester Group Investment Management, an affiliate of TIAA. Gentlemen. Thank you, Steve. Uh, welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for joining this stream. Uh, it's a pleasure to be doing this Why Invest in Farmer Now session with Ned uh, from the University of Illinois Foundation. Uh, we've also got Teresa Goldberg, uh, who's a Westchester um, senior portfolio client specialist, who's going to help us with the sides and some of the, the questions um, as we move towards the end of the, the hour here. But just as a a quick um, summary of what we're looking to cover. We're looking to cover the case for farmland investment, the characteristics of the asset class. Um, we're going to talk about a few additional thematic aspects. Uh, and then Ned's going to give the University of Illinois Foundation's perspective on farmland investment. And then what we're hoping to do is to get some really good questions coming in um, from those of you participating, which we can move into a a discussion session and, and maybe just talk about some of the things that have happened in the last 12 months and the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on uh, on farmland. So, Teresa, if we can move to slide two, I just very quickly wanted to give you a quick background to, to who we are. So, Westchester is the TIAA-owned farmland investment business. Uh, we've been in existence since 1986, investing globally since 2017. Uh, we manage about 2.2 million acres of farmland in seven countries globally. And the reason why we invest globally is to diversify, to, to in, uh, build into our portfolios a natural hedge against the risks that are inherent in the asset class. Uh, we have quite a bit of scale in some of the uh, crop types that we manage. So we manage row crops and permanent crops. When I say permanent crops, I mean things like wine grapes, tree nuts, citrus avocado. Uh, last year in California, we produced about 100,000 tons of wine grapes. Uh, that's enough to produce about 78 million bottles of wine. Uh, we manage capital for TIAA, and then we manage capital for an additional uh, 30 investors aside of the TIA general account. So in the last two years, we've been talking about the compelling case to invest in agriculture or farmland. Um, and it's almost unimaginable that, that we're sitting here uh, with what's happened in the last 12 months. Um, and history's told us about the return characteristics of farmland, and we've certainly seen that play out uh, in, in the last 12 months. So if I can start on slide four, um, farmland's a very resilient asset class. It's a very durable store of value. And the chart here is showing an S&P 500 composite and the NACREF Farmland Index. So NACREF is the National Council for Real Estate Investment Fiduciaries Index, which has been in existence since 1990. Uh, there are almost 1,200 properties in the index for a total value of about $12.4 uh, billion worth of asset value. But every time we've gone through a downturn in the economy, whether that be the stock market crash in the early 90s, the tech bubble in the early 2000s, or more recently, the global financial crisis, we're yet to add uh, the last 12 months here. Farmland has performed particularly well when um, stocks and traditional asset classes have seen a significant drawdown in their value. I, I want to talk about the return characteristic of farmland on slide five. One of the things that historically has attracted investors to the asset class is the low volatility uh, of returns and the correlation characteristics that farmland demonstrates. And the scatter graph on the left hand side of the, of the, the slide here just shows different um, asset classes, uh, a number of real assets, including real estate and timberland and farmland. And what farmland has done historically is put, it's, it's given really strong returns, uh, but with very low volatility. And that low volatility comes about because farmland is producing the necessities of life. So there's an inelasticity of demand associated with what's being produced on farmland. Um, and if we look at the data series here is 1999 to 2019, 
But if we go back to 1966, right the way through to today, the average return on, from farmland has been 11%. About 6% of that has come from income return and 5% from appreciation in value. Now, the correlation with other asset classes um, farmland is producing things which are sensitive to inflation. So we do see a positive correlation with uh, inflation, negative correlation with stocks. Um, and that means that farmland is a very good inflation hedge um, from a portfolio point of view. And historically, investors have seen it as a very good way to diversify their, their portfolios. Just to expand on the theme of inflation on slide six, um, this is a, 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 some research which is uh, conducted by the TIAA Center for Farmland Research. So we have a, a partnership with the Department of Agriculture at the University of Illinois, uh, looking at farmland return characteristics. Professor Bruce Sherrick runs that um, research unit. Uh, and one of the things that we're hearing a lot about today is increased um, concerns about inflationary environment coming back. So we've seen how a just-in-time delivery is exposed um, by the crisis. We've seen some food shortages um, and there are food security concerns in various countries and that can lead to rapid inflation. So the top chart is showing, uh, going back to 1962, um, consumer price index versus the 10-year treasury. So you'll see there highlighted in grey the different periods where we have seen an inflationary environment. The bottom chart is showing the USDA uh, return data going back to 1970. And farmland, with the exception of one or two uh, places, has shown a very good correlation um, with inflation. A little bit of deviation in the global financial crisis um, and in the early 1980s where um, we had in very high inflation rates. Um, but what we're seeing in government policy, where we do see increased concern about in inflation, it does register in the price and income of soft commodities and the, the fixed factors producing them. And the research does show that over time, it's been a very good um, protection against inflation as an, an, as an investment. I just wanted to touch on some of the other themes of investment. So on slide seven, um, the long-term farmland value drivers, any investment in the agricultural sector fundamentally is underpinned by what we're seeing in population growth and also more discerning diet. So the FAO predict that there will be 9.7 billion people on the planet by 2050, but it's not only increased number of people, um, increased calorific consumption. So today less than, um, sorry, 3% of uh, global population um, by 2050 will consume a less than 2,500 calories a day. So increased consumption of calories, um, general population increase, but also we will see the decline in availability of, of, of farmland. So the chart on the left uh, showing the declining availability of farmland per capita. The other theme which really underpins farmland returns in the long term um, is productivity. And I do want to talk a little bit about the impact of productivity in the sector. So over time, we have seen uh, productivity becoming a much more important feature um, in driving farmland values and returns. The information on the chart on the right hand side uh, is from the University of uh, Illinois analysis of um, Illinois farmland over the last 15 years. So productivity is important in the sector. Expanding on that theme on, on slide eight. So you have this fundamental characteristic of the asset class. It's, it's generally attractive, but what we see today is we do see significant growth for upside in, in returns driven by adoption of technology. Um, the chart on the top of slide eight looks at Purdue information on um, corn yields through time. So if we think about the various evolutions that we've had, uh, we had mechanization um, evolution in the 1930s and 1940s. We had the green revolution really from the 60s through uh, to, the, to the late 80s. And more recently, we moved into a data revolution 
So we're seeing a huge impact from technologies um, like remote sensors, um, augmented reality, virtual reality, artificial intelligence, mounting remote sensors on drones, um, satellite imagery, and all of these things um, enhancing the decision making in the agricultural production cycle. Uh, the chart on the bottom just shows the adoption of technology uh, over time. So the more modern technologies have been very rapidly uh, adopted by, by farmers. So we do see a boost to productivity. It's not just about increased yields. It's also about uh, the efficiency of production. So more efficient conversion uh, of inputs into outputs. So just to summarize before I move on to some other things to consider, it's a very resilient asset class, downside protection when we see um, a, a cycle that we've seen uh, in the last 12 months. It's very good for income generation. Um, you have this correlation with inflation and not being correlated with traditional asset class classes. It's a very good inflation hedge and fundamentals drive value with potential uplift in the long term. I want to talk now about a few other things to consider. So on slide 10, It's a very nascent asset class. Uh, farmland is really well behind some of the other real assets like timber uh, and real estate from an evolutionary point of view. Um, and if we look at the institutional ownership of farmland, um, there's been work done which showed um, last year that the total institutional ownership of farmland globally is about $51 billion. If you look at a, the total universe of farmland globally at about $29 trillion, um, less than 0.2% of farmland globally is institutionally owned currently. Um, now, if we look at global invested capital, uh, the split between equity and debt and then alternatives, um, there's 0.04% of, of, of uh, capital invested in farmland. If we look at the universe that we consider to be investable globally, um, we consider that there's about $1.2 trillion of cropland, um, which is of institutional quality and can best be invested in uh, globally. The amount that is invested is very, very small. So it's, it's an asset class which is in a, a very um, immature and, and in its infancy. Now, on slide 11, one of the things that, that the sector desperately needs is an inflow of outside capital. Uh, the World Bank suggests that the agricultural sector needs about $80 billion of capital on an annual basis. More recent work by the FAO suggests that $350 billion worth of capital is needed to transform ag and food systems annually for the next 10 years. So that's to invest in, in technology but one of the things that we see in the sector, and we see this in all countries globally, is you have significant consolidation in, in the sector, um, and that has been driven by an aging farmer population. So um, as an example, the average age of a farmer in um, more than 32% of farmers in, in Europe are over 65 years of age. And I've used a few da data points there for US farmland, but the story's the same uh, wherever you look at the research, the prediction is a significant amount of land will change hands over the next 5, 10, 20 years. And really, that's where you're seeing transfer from uh, elderly farming um, profile to a younger generation who don't want to work in, in the agricultural sector and are moving to um, other, other jobs, uh, other locations. Now, that's not to say that family farms are not important to the sector, they certainly are. And agriculture globally still really is focused around family owned and operated private businesses. Um, so that middle size uh, farmer is important to the sector, but they are expanding. The way they're expanding is they're leasing land, uh, which is owned by institutions or for that matter, private investors um, and if we look at the tenant base that we have in the US, we, we manage about 270,000 acres of land. We have 155 tenants across that uh, land. Um, only 
Uh, all of those tenants are family businesses with the exception of three uh, businesses. So it, it is a very much a family oriented business activity and institutional capital is facilitating um, consolidation in the sector. I want to talk about natural capital, something we hear talked about increasingly today. So on slide 12, um, what we've seen historically, what, what are the component parts that make up farmland value? Well, farmland historically really has only been valued based on what can be produced in the way of food and fiber. But if we think about natural capital assets and we think about all the other component parts of those, um, Farmland values in the future will undoubtedly reflect the full uh, range of things that are relevant to farmland. So water quality, soil health, biodiversity, um, ecosystem services people talk about. So we will increasingly see other component parts driving farmland value. And the most uh, the thing that's evident currently that is going to drive that is the potential to sequester carbon in soil and, and to monetize that value. So um, soil is a, is a huge store of carbon um, and that is one of the most likely places where we will see natural capital value monetized in the short term. Just to expand on that theme on slide 13, um, Agriculture has historically come in for quite a bit of criticism about its con contribution to, to greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and if you think about 25% of greenhouse gas emissions coming from the sector, um, the split between change of land use and, and the actual ag agricultural activity itself uh, is about 50-50. But the Paris Climate Accord, the 2020 agre 2010 agreement um, we're, we're really bound to reduce the carbon footprint of agriculture from 12 gigatons globally uh, to 4 gigatons uh, by 2050. Now, although agriculture uh, can be a significant contributor to um, greenhouse gas emissions, it does provide one of the most scalable solutions to countering um, climate change. The plants that we're growing, the trees, the soybeans, the corn is taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And if we can return the crop residue to the ground and increase soil organic matter, um, it is a very scalable solution for countering climate change. 40% of the Earth's surface is involved in food production. The research suggests that between a tonne and 1.8 tonnes per acre of carbon dioxide can be sequestered and put into soil in a regenerative uh, farmland system. And, and the last point really to mention is that um, we, we sometimes forget about the significant impact that biofuels can have um, on reducing greenhouse gas emissions and the use, extensive use of ethanol in Brazil as a vehicle fuel um, has reduced emissions by 523 million tonnes um, in recent years. So just to summarise on slide 14 before I hand over to Ned to give a bit of a perspective from an investor's point of view, um, just to summarise. So the fundamentals make for a very compelling investment case, the returns, but if we think about the sector, it's an additional source of capital which can facilitate generational transfer of wealth and to allow entrepreneurial farming family businesses to expand. It's an untapped asset class um, and capital is needed for structural change in the sector. There are added benefits that we see today, natural capital value uh, and the potential for carbon sequestration. So overall, that does lead to a very compelling investment theme, which I guess is one of the reasons why there is significantly increased um, attention on the asset class. So I'll just now hand over to Ned um, just to take you through the perspective of the University of Illinois Foundation. Thanks, Martin. So perhaps let me begin by giving a little bit of background on UIF, because I think it's important to understand how we approached investing in farmland and agriculture more broadly. Um, so at the foundation, um, if you could advance to the next slide, Teresa. At the foundation, we manage an endowment pool of a little over $2 billion on behalf of the University of Illinois system. 
the internal office is still relatively new. Uh, in 2013, the board made the strategic decision to build out an internal office. Ellen Ellison was hired and brought in as the CIO to do that. I joined her in 2014 to focus on building out our private markets program, which includes real assets and particularly farmland investing. As we thought about how to build out the program, one of the things that um, both Ellen and I are firm believers in is the importance of using the strategic advantages of your institution to your benefit and trying to find ways to leverage them and build a portfolio around it. Um, and clearly agriculture is something where the university has a very strong strategic advantage. Um, U of I is one of the leading agricultural schools in the world. We have a very long history of cutting edge research and innovation in agriculture. We also have a long history of alumni supporting the university through donations of farmlands. Um, so between the university and the foundation, we have a portfolio of approximately 15,000 acres of farmland that we own directly. And so as a result of that, you know, we made the decision to make agriculture an area of strategic focus for the endowment. For a lot of the reasons that Mar Martin just spoke about, we think that farmland is a very attractive asset class, particularly for long-term investors, such as an endowment or a foundation. Um, as Martin alluded to, there are a number of secular trends that support growing demand for agricultural products, particularly when you think about population growth, as well as the changing composition of the population and demand for um, higher caloric content in emerging markets. Agriculture also has the benefit of generating a stable cash yield over time. Um, as an endowment and as, as a perpetual pool of capital, inflation is one of the biggest risks that we face. So we have to think about how we preserve the purchasing power of that pool over time. And given um, the nature of agriculture investment, it, it is a natural inflation hedge. And also importantly, the return streams that farmland can generate are uncorrelated with other, other asset classes. So it really has really interesting diversification benefits for a large institutional portfolio. And then the last point, and I think Martin alluded to this, it is a nascent asset class. And so as we looked at agriculture, it is still an area where institutional investors are relatively underrepresented. Uh, the universe of managers, though growing, is still quite small. And so we saw an opportunity to really take advantage of that and be sort of first movers in the asset class. As we started building out the program, we wanted to find ways to take advantage of our position. And one of the first things that we did was we created a farmland advisory council. And so this was a group of people that included representatives both from um, different stakeholders in the organization. So people from the inv investment office, such as myself, as well as some of our colleagues from the advancement side. Uh, we brought in the university's ma farm management team, as well as representatives and academics from the College of ACES. And we used that council to coordinate our efforts around farmland investing across the organization. We tried to harmonize our approach for how we managed our directly owned farmland, as well as developing a consistent message for the community. It was important that we wanted people to know that the foundation was a long-term investor, that we were a good steward of the land, and that we were committed to holding and operating the donated farmland for the long term. The council has also been a great resource for me as we've hired individual managers and in, in farmland strategies within the pooled endowment. It's been a great thinking um, uh, think tank really for me to bounce ideas off of and help think about where the best uh, areas within farmland to focus on. As we think about portfolio construction um, across our, our whole endowment, we take a very holistic view. And so it was important to think about the exposures across the organization, both within the active investment pool, as well as some of the direct farmland that we own on the balance sheet. And we think about, um, as we think about that portfolio, it is all uh, Midwest row crops. So it's, it's really a function of donations that have been given to us. This isn't land that we went out and actively bought. And so it is very concentrated both geographically in the Midwest, as well as by crop type. It's all really corn and soybeans in the Midwest. And so as we thought about how to build out the investment portfolio in the active pool, we really wanted to balance that allocation uh, within our natural resources allocation. If you could move to the next slide, Teresa. And so that really led us to think about um, agriculture as, as a theme that we, we have found ways to express across the portfolio. So at the top of this slide, I've really laid out just a very simple diagram of how we think about the agriculture value chain uh, in sort of the risk return spectrum. At the far left, you see row crops. And so these are the commodity crops such as corn and soybeans that really are the lowest risk and lowest return um, part of the asset class. 
And then as you move right in into produce and specialty crops and permanent crops, you're moving up both in terms of expected risk as well as expected return. And then as you continue moving right into things like agribusiness, and so this is moving into vertically integrated agribusiness corporations, inputs, processors, and then eventually into ag tech, which is really a venture capital-like investment. So everything sort of to the right is really more of a private equity-like risk return profile, whereas from permanent crops to the left is more of a real asset type return profile. And so for us, we are, you know, we are thematic investors and we try to exploit long-term trends that we can invest in multiple ways across the portfolio and across multiple asset classes. And so that's something that we've done with agriculture. So you'll see that agriculture shows up in our private equity portfolio, it shows up in our natural resources portfolio and our real estate portfolio, et cetera. Um, if we think about agriculture in total, um, we have about a little over 6% of the endowment is invested in agriculture in this, in this theme, if you will. And I think I would point out, you know, I'm going to talk about talk about the numbers as we built them as an example of, of our portfolio. It's important to keep in mind that every institution has a different set of needs and different set of circumstances. And so you want to, as you think about building an agriculture portfolio, you really need to adapt it to your own certain circumstances. Um, so the numbers, I think, are not so much important as the overall thought process of how to construct a portfolio. But as we think about our portfolio, it really is anchored by that portfolio of direct farmland. And so we have a little over two and a half percent is in row crops. Um, this is all, as I said, Midwest uh, corn and soybeans. And so as we built out the investment portfolio to complement that, we really wanted to move across the value chain to sort of uh, balance out the risk return portfolio. So within our natural resources portfolio, we've allocated uh, roughly another two and a half percent in natural resources to agriculture so far. And that really is split between both produce and specialty produce as well as permanent crops. So th these are higher up uh, the rich risk return spectrum. They offer um, greater return and greater yields for us, but consequently have a little bit more risk and a little bit more illiquidity. And then we also found, as we looked at investing in agriculture across the value chain, we found a number of really interesting opportunities within the agribusiness sector that really were in sort of the private equity space. These were operating companies that had relatively small exposures to the actual production assets. And so we have roughly, you know, a percent and a half uh, in private equity like investments in the agribusiness sector. In terms of how we went about, you know, actually implementing the portfolio construction, again, a, a good chunk of it, about two and a half percent is that direct farmland that we own. The bulk of that sits on our balance sheet. We have begun the process of moving some of that into the pooled endowment. Um, as farms become available and are appropriate for that, we will do that. And we made the decision that we're willing to hold up to 5% of the endowment in those directly owned farmlands. Um, we, the balance of it, however, is invested through commingled funds that are managed by third party managers. Um, so these would be funds such as Martin managers at Westchester. And the bulk of it really is in those funds. We do also have a very active co-investment program at the foundation. And so co-investment is where we will make additional investments directly into um, directly into assets held by those funds. And so I think as we look about it, um, we've tried to balance our exposure in the portfolio across this risk reward spectrum. Uh, we, do, we do expect that this exposure to farmland will grow over time. In terms of our directly owned asset, uh, directly owned farmland, that's something where we're not actively out buying farmland, but we are certainly willing and, and looking to accept more donations. And so that's something that will grow over time, we hope through the advancement side of, of our business, of uh, accepting additional gifts into the farmland program. And within the natural resources portfolio, we're looking to add both in produce and, and permanent crops, as well as into fund managers that have some degree of vertical integration. And so these would be company, companies that invest in both the production assets, but will also own some of the midstream infrastructure, such as pack houses or processing plants. Uh, we tend to avoid the consumer facing end of the, of the spectrum as we think the risk return portfolio profile there is less attractive to us. And then lastly, I would say, you know, agribusiness within private equity, again, we think is a really interesting opportunity set um, and we will selectively do that. We do not, you know, our, our focus to manager hiring is really a bottom up approach. So within the agribusiness theme or the agriculture theme, we're looking for that across the portfolio, but in terms of individual manager selection, it's really driven by the opportunities that we see on the ground uh, from a bottom up basis. 
And so we try to look at it uh, in multiple menus, looking at ag as a whole theme, as I've shown it here. But then we also look at it within a traditional asset allocation framework where we have agriculture investments that will be within private equity. We have agriculture investments that will be within our natural resources portfolio. Um, and I think um, the last thing I would say on that is that we don't have a specific target for agriculture overall. We have within within our natural resources allocation, a total of 6% is the current strategic allocation. And so I would expect that we could go up to maybe three or 4% in agriculture or in farmland directly within the natural resources portfolio. But again, I think this the important thing here is this is just a snapshot of how we built our program. And I think really the focus was on finding ways to leverage the university's natural strengths and building a portfolio within the investment pool that complements that exist pre-existing exposure. Um, obviously, many investors won't have that exposure. And, and I, the thing I would definitely uh, wouldn't want you to take away from this is that you had to have a portfolio of farmland to start with. I think this is an asset class that is very accessible to any institutional investor. And while the, the universe of managers, I think, is small, it is definitely growing. And there are some very high quality ones that have been there for a very long time. Um, and so I think this is an asset class that definitely is available to institutional investors and has a lot of really interesting characteristics that can benefit an institutional portfolio. And so let me stop there and maybe we could move to uh, questions and answers. Yeah, I, I think Ned, we don't have a great number of questions come in uh, just yet. So maybe if we can just go ahead and, and as we'd originally planned, just talk about some of the impacts of the, the COVID-19 pan pandemic on the agriculture and food sector. And maybe if I just start off here with a couple of slides just to set the scene and then we can um, have a bit of dis a discussion about what we've seen and what, uh, what we think are some of the implications from an asset class perspective going forward. So just a, a bit of a reminder of where we are currently from an economic point of view on slide 19, if you would do, please, uh, Teresa. So this is OECD uh, data from the September economics outlook uh, last year. So, of course, um, significant drop in global GDP growth across many countries and the tra trajectory for recovery. Um, and, of course, this was last year. I, I guess this probably will be... Uh, redefined again, given some of the developments with new strains of the virus. But um, the economic outlook is pretty tough uh, in, in, the, in the immediate term. Just really, ag agriculture depends on what the consumer is doing, what the consumer is spending. Um, on slide 20, um, there's some information here on US uh, spending on food. Um, right the way through from January of last year through to August. So really through the height of the, the main part of the pandemic. Um, so you've got a split here between food consumed in the home um, and then away from home. So restaurant, cafeteria, food services and so on. Uh, so we did see in um, the height of the pandemic in March and April last year, a real significant drop off in consumption of food away from the home. Um, but we did see that offset by um, food consumed in the home. But of course, the margins on food consumed away from home tend to be higher. So if you look at the total spend, the increase in at-home spend doesn't completely offset um, what we lost in, in restaurants and so on. Um, we have seen a recovery to that, um, but there is we are running a little bit behind. But generally... And, and, and the, slide, the next slide, slide 21, which is European retail trade volume, um, does show that overall, um, if you look year on year, the changes in consumption of food, drinks um, and, and tobacco, um, not fairly stable when compared to other um, things. So significant reduction in, in, in retail spend on textiles, clothing and footwear, um, reduction in computers and books, uh, reduction in pharmaceuticals, um, of course, non-food, homeware, DIY and gardening. We were all at home. We did see increases there. But overall, the message is that the food and drink consumption is, is stable. 
just looking at that from a commodity point of view on slide 22, um, and, and this is looking at um, commodity in, indices um, and also currency indices. So for us investing in uh, locations outside the US, what's happening in, with currency is, is quite relevant. But we did see across all commodities a significant drop at the height of the pandemic. Uh, but we have seen fairly strong recovery um, across uh, pretty much all commodities. Uh, of course, we haven't seen much uh, a great recovery in oil prices. And that connection of ethanol um, with oil and the fuel complex really has meant that um, that ethanol and sugar is something which hasn't recovered uh, as quite as strongly as some of the corn, um, soybeans, wheat, and, and, and so on. Um, what we have seen with currency movement is we've seen devalua significant devaluation of uh, the Brazilian AI, which has in Brazil at a local level meant that farmers have had an exceptionally good year in 2020. Uh, they're producing corn, soybeans, cotton, and that ultimately um, the pricing is based around uh, Chicago. So very strong profitability at a local level um, in, in Brazil, driven by the valuation of the currency. Most other currencies have recovered pretty strongly. Um, but that's the, that's the general picture on commodity. And, and we are indeed now seeing quite a significant run on commodities. So um, 2021 harvest uh, futures on soybean up to $12 a bushel, corn at uh, $4.70. So we've seen a strong recovery in commodity prices overall. But how does that translate in, into farmland returns overall? So just one final slide here before we go into a bit of a discussion, just look, thinking of the different aspects that are relevant from an agricultural perspective. So I mentioned NACRI earlier. Um, the, 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 the table in the top left, that's the NACRI returns. That was up until the end of Q3 um, for, for 2020. Um, we have the Q4 data in now and the total return for farming on NACRI for the year has come out at a shade over 3%. Um, so we've got the split between row crops, so row crops, exchange traded commodity crops, uh, and the permanent crops, things that grow on a, a tree, a bush or a vine. Um, but when you compare to some other asset classes, some um, real estate uh, sectors, some infrastructure sector um, investments, farmland has performed overall pretty well uh, in, in 2020, and that's the resilience of the asset class. Uh, the chart on the top right really just is to give some sense on what the pandemic has had uh, impacting the sector on um, the operational aspect. So um, no real difference in planted area of corn uh, between 2019 and 2020. There was some concern at one stage that the availability of materials to farmers, the availability of labour would impact um, field operations, but we haven't really seen that. Um, and that really came through uh, to harvest as well. I talked about Brazil and the currency devaluation. Um, there's been an incredible year in Brazil uh, in the way of exports, very good across all different crop sectors, but Brazilian soybean exports to China have been um, at record levels. Um, so it's been a very strong year there. So the message there really is trade flows have not been interrupted by the pandemic. And, and just really, if we think about agriculture, it's been uh, deemed as a, a critical sector globally. So agricultural activity is carried on more or less uninterrupted by uh, what's been going on. The final thing, and this is quite important to us with some of the investments that we make is um, what's happening to, to wine consumption. Uh, we look at the Nielsen fast moving consumer goods data uh, and alcohol wine um, in the US um, and overall through the pandemic in the same way as total spend on food was um, down off um, away away from the home wine consumption in restaurants clearly um, tasting and um, sellers and so on was was down significantly but overall through the really the majority of last year in the height of the pandemic wine sales were 24 percent higher uh, we look for at least a 20% uh, increase in sales to offset 
um, the reduction. So uh, again, um, there has been some impact, but when you consider other sectors, um, um, very little impact to agriculture, which translates through into the stability from a from a return point of view. So I, I think um, we have got some questions come in. So Ned, if you're happy, maybe we can um, just try and take a few questions and, and maybe talk about some of the themes um, that we're seeing in the sector and what we think uh, will evolve and maybe some of the changes that have been catalyzed by the pandemic. Um, so maybe we can try and take some questions, Theresa, if you're if you've sure. got some coming in. Thank you, Martin. Actually, the first question is for you. Are the investment returns from farmland in the form of a percentage of farmland proceeds or is it a cash rent lease? Yeah, so that, that, that would really depend uh, on the way that you approach the farmland. So what we tend to do with um, land that's producing row crops, so the exchange traded commodity crops, corn, soybeans, wheat, uh, canola, cotton, we tend to lease the land growing those crops out to local farmers. I talked about the tenants that we have earlier. Um, the reason why is we think there's limited opportunities to add value and local farmers are very efficient at, at producing where it's essentially the lowest cost of production gain. However, in the case of permanent crops, wine grapes, um, almonds, citrus, walnuts, pistachios, we tend to operate those assets. So the difference that we have where we're leasing out, the income return is simply coming from uh, the lease payments that we're receiving. Whereas in the case of permanent crops, the income is coming from actual physical sale of the crop that we're producing. Um, now it's very complementary to put those two sort of investments together in a portfolio. So you've got a, a lower risk investment with row crops it's a straight real estate play. Um, I think of permanent crops, maybe more of an infrastructure type play where you're operating the asset. You've got enhancement to income return because you're taking that risk, um, but you haven't got the, the, the concerns of, of, of um, where you lease out with row crops. It's complementary in a portfolio. Um, so we would always look to diversify. We would in both instances look to see some capital growth over time, but in the case of permanent crops, you have a biological asset, which it doesn't matter what crop it is, um, has a set lifespan. So you're depreciating a biological asset uh, where you have underlying land, which is appreciating value. So we would not expect to get the same appreciation in value from um, permanent crops as we would row crops. Thank you, Martin. And, and the next question is for um, Ned. When you move donated agriculture land into the endowment, what are you using for cost basis for calculating returns? Yeah, so as we, you know, we've just begun the process of doing that in the past couple of years, but when, when a farm comes into the pooled endowment, we have an appraisal done. Um, so all of the farms get appraised every year anyways, but we have an appraisal done at the date we take it and that forms um, the cost basis for their purchase into the endowment pool. And then going forward, we continue, you know, our farmland manager does annual appraisals that we use um, to mark the capital appreciation as well as the income return uh, throughout the year. And Martin, how does that, how is that similar or different from the way that you value farmland in your portfolios? Yeah, so there's a little bit of variation across the different portfolios. But wherever we have a portfolio with this third party capital, um, we value at a minimum with an independent third party appraiser on an annual basis. Uh, we do have one particular fund structure, which is an open ended fund uh, where we have quarterly valuations, which uh, marks the value of the units for incoming uh, investors. So we have a valuation cycle there whereby uh, we do a full appraisal, we do a desktop appraisal with a third party appraiser. So both of those are completely independent. And then in between those uh, two independents, we do an analysis internally and mark the value in accordance with that, that mark. But 
all of the assets are on that cycle. So you, you, you do have two independent valuations um, on an annual basis. Thank you, Martin. And, and a question for you both. Um, when you think about the administration of your program, Ned, over the last year, what have the challenges been? And Martin, then in terms of acquiring farmland in the last year, what have the challenges been? You know, I, th I think for us, you know, one of the, ch um, you know, one of the challenges is simply bringing into um, sort of harmonizing our approach to how we manage farmland across the portfolio. Um, and I think that's something that we've done. You know, one of the things we face is we would, you know, and this sort of alludes to the earlier question, we would like to have more crop share leasing in our directly owned farmland. There are challenges to us as a nonprofit um, for tax reasons of what, which of sort of the crop insurance programs we can participate in. So it limits how much we can do that. So the majority of that portfolio really is more cash rent. Um, although we would like to see more of it in crop share over time. Um, but that's really been the biggest, uh, I would say, challenge with the directly owned farmland. And then with our third party managers, I would say, um, you know, not so much a challenge, but, you know, as as elsewhere in the world, you know, prices, evaluations have been quite high. And so finding ways to deploy capital um, at scale and attractive valuations is, I think, is always a challenge. Yeah, so Teresa, I think the question directed me was to me was what what challenges we ha have had we had in the last year uh, in the way of acquiring farmland. I think there's there's a range of things which which have come up, but I think the first thing I would say is um, we have, our business model is very much a local model. So in all the places where we invest, we have people on the ground. Uh, who manage those assets, who identify new acquisitions. A lot of those acquisitions are identified off market. Um, so the, the actual practicalities of getting people to do due diligence from within our own team um, has been, there's been no issues there because we're in close proximity to the assets. So that's an advantage of the structure of business that we have. However, we do need to bring some third parties in and then as, as an example, we do an environmental phase one audit on any acquisition that we make. Uh, we have to contract that out to a professional um, environmental company. So we have had a few issues with getting people on property because they've had to travel. Um, they've had to make a flight or, or they've had to travel from distance, which hasn't been possible. Um, one of the things that we've seen in a few locations is where you don't have um, land title, um, systems which are digitized so you've got a courthouse where you have to go and get the actual original title documents uh, so that's caused a few few delays in one or two uh, locations uh, but overall I would say that there, there really has been a limited impact on our ability to, to to make acquisitions I think it's where we need to bring in third parties it's presented um, one or two challenges and and also in systems that are relevant in the transfer of title and so on. Thank you, Martin. And then another question for actually you you both is the way that you think about exits in the asset class. Um, so Ned, do you, um, you're acquiring and holding the land forever? And, and Martin, if you could allude to that as well. Sh sure, so um, let, let me distinguish between our directly owned farmland our directly owned farmland, we although in order to take it into the pool, we have to have the ability to sell it. To sell it, we have made a commitment that we're going to be long-term holders of that, so we don't expect um, to sell it. We don't actively sell that portfolio. Um, that's something that we intend to hold for a very long time. Within the investment pool, sort of our third mar third-party managed funds, um, those funds are typically have a 10 to 12-year life. Uh, some of them a little bit longer. And I think individual assets, you know, ultimately where we see most of the, the sales happening are to sort of larger, particularly large sovereign wealth funds and some of the Canadian pension plan, plans who are willing to buy some of these assets once they have been um, stabilized and fully developed at very attractive um, prices for us. So those are things that typically we would own for anywhere from, uh, you know, five, six, seven years before they're ultimately sold. Yeah. So Teresa, how, how do we, we think of exit? So we, I would say in all the structures that we have, we are really minded towards being a long-term owner of um, good quality farmland. 
Um, however, we do look to um, sell assets at various points in time. That could be because we're just trying to adjust the, the profile of allocation to different crop types, or we might um, just be opportunistic. Uh, the, the range of exit routes is, is, is multiple. Um, and of course, uh, there are, as, the, as the maturity of the asset class develops, um, and you get more interest in the sector, selling to other institutions or corporate owners um, clearly does become an exit option. Um, but it, it, if I consider the exits that we've made across different geographies uh, in the last two or three years, um, we've sold um, vineyards to uh, somebody who wants to develop a winery. Uh, we've sold um, farms in the Midwest to an individual um, who has a number of farms from an investment point of view um, in the Midwest. Uh, we've sold properties in Australia to local farmers. Um, so Australia's had quite a good period agriculturally. The, the sector's feeling quite bullish. So there's a lot of individual farmer interests. Uh, we have sold property to um, a company involved in processing. Um, so they, they view this as securing feedstock to actually have control over their own production. So there are multiple um, exit routes and, and as the asset class develops um, and you get more investor interest selling um, in larger uh, parcel sizes and multiple properties or even portfolios or even um, a, an, an overall investment structure which ha might have many properties in it um, becomes an option. So. I would say it's quite attractive because of the flexibility and exit route that, that exists. Thank you, Martin. Annette, a question from you, for you. Um, can you speak a bit more to the Farmland Advisory Council at the University of Illinois, the makeup and its role? Sure. So, so the makeup, really, we tried to pull together people from across the organization. So, you know, as I mentioned, it was myself from the investment office. Um, some of the folks from the advancement side at the foundation, um, particularly who worked with the College of Aces. Um, we brought in um, several representatives from the College of Aces, so some people from the Dean's office, as well as uh, some of the professors. Um, and then also um, from the university side, um, the university has an in-house farm manager, so we asked that person to bring on, to come on and join us. And the role really was, it, there were a couple things we thought about. So one, as I mentioned, kind of, making sure that we have a consistent approach to how we manage and message about our farmland investments at both the foundation and the university. Um, as well as for me, it's been a sounding board to think about what are some of the what are some of the things that look interesting in the agriculture space and in farmland investing. So as we think about how to build out that portfolio, you know, what are some what are some things that were being seen on the academic side? What are some strategies that might complement what we held in the existing portfolio? Thank you, Ned. Um, Martin, a question for you. Do you see the, sh the shift at, to at-home food sales remaining post-COVID? And how, how are you taking advantage of that, if you do? Uh, I think we're going to see increased consumption at home for, for the foreseeable future. Uh, we are, of course, going to see a recovery in, in the restaurant trade and food services. Uh, but one of the things which the pandemic has certainly brought is a renewed interest in home baking, cooking, um, closer connection between health and nutrition. Um, so there is a lot more interest in, I think, the provenance of, of what's been bought, um, traceability, the sustainability aspect. Um, there's lots of innovations where, where I, I think we're seeing um, consumer preference, we're seeing innovation where um, they're in, an ingredients box is being sold. There's a number of businesses that have done exceptionally well uh, with that concept. Uh, so I, I think overall, we will see that staying and we will see more of a focus on um, the quality of what uh, people are, are, are buying because uh, consumption is not just seen as a functional activity. It's more of a um, an actual part of the day, there's, there's more of an interest in, uh, in what, what you're eating. Um, that theme that I mentioned there with um, closer connection between health and nutrition, 
undoubtedly um, is driving uh, a move towards um, healthy food. So that was a trend that was already in existence, but it's been accelerated. So consumption of nuts, uh, berries, avocado consumption. Um, if you look at somewhere like Europe, um, avocado consumption in Europe has just gone absolutely crazy in the last um, 10 years. Um, so we're, we're seeing continued consumption of superfoods. One of the things, the other things that we've seen again, which you could say is it revolves around increased spend on higher quality food is uh, organic consumption has increased. Uh, in some countries last year, organic consumption increased by 27%. France, uh, a good example there. I think the information in the US suggests that organic produce increased by about 15% in the US. So trend which will stay, uh, how long the focus on quality um, will stay is, is, is questionable, but answer, without doubt there is more focus on the connection between health and nutrition. Um, what we are trying to do is, I don't think there's any wholesale changes to the investment strategies that we have. We try and diversify by crop type. The land we manage today grows 43 different crop types. And within that crop type mix, you have almonds, you have pistachios, walnuts, avocado, citrus, table grapes, uh, which are all groups which have seen significant increase in consumption. The last thing I would comment on is vegetarianism. Uh, undoubtedly, there's been a move away from meat um, and milk to uh, milk alternatives, oat milk, almond milk, um, whatever. Um, yeah, but if you're investing in cropland, which is producing soybean, which is producing um, other pulses, peas, beans, um, those are the fundamental ingredients for um, the protein source in a, a plant-based diet. So I think the strategies that we have um, are well aligned to what's happening from a consumer trend point of view. Um, I would be quite worried today uh, if I was heavily invested in dairy or beef production, uh, those are not sectors that we invest in at all, uh, but undoubtedly they are going to be challenged with the trend towards reduction in, in, in meat consumption. Thank you, Martin. Uh, I think we probably have time for maybe one to two more questions. Uh, Ned, a question for you. Do the donors to the University of Illinois often specifically specifically request that their farmland remain in production and not be developed? Um, so it definitely varies and I'd say each, each case we obviously handle on, on, on a case by case basis. Um, so many of the farms come with uh, perhaps restrictions or on sale, that sort of thing. Um, in order for us to take it into the pooled endowment, it has to be free of those restrictions, even though we intend to keep it in production and to keep it um, um, and not to sell it, we have to have the ability to do that, to have it in the pooled endowment. Um, but so, so if a farm comes in that doesn't meet that criteria, we still take it and we just keep it separately on the balance sheet. Um, from, you know, as I said, we handle that on a case by case basis. From our perspective, we like the asset class and it's still, given where we are now, we, we would like to have more of it. So we have no problem, um, you know, committing to donors that we intend to keep it, you um, know, a to keep it and not sell it and also to keep it in production and oftentimes you know we consider who's oftentimes these are farms that are leased to a local operator and so we certainly keep that in consideration as we accept it and oftentimes we'll keep the same operator on the land even as the ownership transfers to us thank you ned um i believe that was our last question okay thank, thanks Teresa. well uh I'd really like to thank everybody for participating. Um, some really great questions coming in there. Um, and it's been a pleasure to, to take this session with you, Ned. Um, you. I, I would say to people participating, if you do have any, any follow-up questions, um, I, I think there's a means of directing them through to myself or Ned. We do have quite a few research papers. Um, as an example, that one I referenced, which was done by the TIA Center for Farmland Research at the University of Illinois. But um, thanks, thanks for listening and, and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks, everyone. It was great to see you all. Thanks, Martin. <laughs>